more minutes while everyone gets in and gets settled with their technology. Please feel free to start in the chat menu by introducing yourself and to offer a land acknowledgement from the territory that you are joining us from today. Thank you. And to those of you who are just joining, we're gonna wait another few minutes while people get in and get settled. While you wait, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat menu. Thank you. And again, to those who are just joining us, we're gonna wait a few more minutes as start about 32 minutes past the hour. Thank you. And a final reminder that we're just waiting patiently for everyone to get in and get settled. Please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat if you'd like to, thank you. All right, folks, we'll get started right now with some technical and housekeeping information and hopefully uh, by the time I'm finished, we'll have the majority of our audience here today. So welcome to the fifth and final day of the 58th annual KEGS conference and to the first of today's concurrent sessions. We're delighted to be joined by a group of esteemed colleagues from the United States who are participating on this panel sponsored by ETS Testing Solutions. We're delighted to have this panel present today. I would like to go over some technical details before we begin. There is simultaneous interpretation offered during this event, and you can access this session in French by clicking on the link available on the landing page for this session, so the page that you use to navigate here. If you would like to pose a question to the speakers, please feel free to type your query into the chat menu located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You may also ask to be handed the virtual mic if you'd like to pose your question verbally, but we do ask that these remain questions and not comments. Finally, this session is being recorded and can be watched and enjoyed later. Without any further ado, I would now like to introduce a special guest for today's panel. Matthew Bashi Kadlubowski is an Associate Director, Academic Support Services in Global Higher Education Division at ETS. Matthew, we are delighted that you're joining today and thank you for moderating this special panel. Thank you, Ian. Uh, bonjour, uh, hello and welcome to today's session, uh, Holistic Admissions for Recruiting and Admitting Diverse Students. Again, I'm Matthew Bashi Kadlubowski, and I'm the Associate Director of Academic Support Services for the GRE program. After today's session, please feel free to reach out to me with any general questions related to the exam, in addition to questions pertaining to various services and resources for institutions. As Ian stated, we'll be, we will be muting you during today's session to help alleviate any background noise However, we absolutely want to hear from you, and I encourage you to place any questions into the chat. I will be monitoring uh, those, and we will do your, uh, our best to hopefully respond to them during the Q&A portion of today's event, which will be after we've heard from all three panelists. I'm honored to introduce you today to our three outstanding panelists, each with their own unique and personal experiences on holistic admissions. Our first panelist is Dr. Maureen Grasso, Maureen is an SASH RAE fellow and professor in the Wilson College of Textiles at North Carolina State University. She served as the Dean of the Graduate School at North Carolina State University and at the University of Georgia. 
She has received numerous awards and recognition for her work, including the Southern Graduate School's Achievement Award for Outstanding Contributions to Graduate Education. She served on the Board of Directors of the Council of Graduate Schools and in key leadership positions for the Conference of Southern Graduate Schools, including President. She also served on the National Academy of Sciences Committee on Revitalizing Graduate STEM Education for the 21st Century. Following Dr. Grasso will be our next panelist, Dr. Steve Matson. Steve is currently a professor in the Department of Biology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. From 2008 to 2019, he was the Dean of the Graduate School at UNC. During his tenure as Dean, he served on the Board of Directors for the Council of Graduate Schools, the GRE Board, and the TOEFL Board. In 2018, he received the Deborah, Deborah W. Stewart Award for Outstanding Leadership in Graduate Education. And our final panelist will be Dr. Carlos Grijalva. Carlos is an Emeritus Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience and former Associate Dean at, at the, of the Graduate Division at UCLA. In his roles as Associate Dean, Dr. Grijalva was responsible for graduate diversity programs and oversaw the Graduate Division offices of diversity, inclusion, and admission and fellowships and financial services. He also served in a variety of administrative positions, including associate dean in the Division of Honors and undergraduate programs in the College of Letters and Sciences and interim chair of the Cesar Chavez Center for Interdisciplinary Instruction in Chicana and Chicano Studies. So let's begin today's session with Dr. Grasso. Maureen, you have the floor. Great, thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, today, I'm gonna speak briefly about recruitment and it's a case study and what to do when you, there's no magic wand. And so let's begin. So we all know that each program has unique recruiting challenges, whether it's um, the type of students, diverse students, the number of students applying to the program. But the bottom line to everything that we do is that programs must actively recruit the students they desire. We just can't wait for them to show up. Steve, if you go back a minute. Um, and so today um, we have some new uh, challenges and some of those challenges is COVID and COVID's creating financial stress that's felt by institutions and students alike. And we must remember that the population that we're recruiting are digital natives. So in the next slide, you'll see some of the top five things that I always recommend to my faculty as I'm working with them to think about recruitment. First, we need to think about establishing funding. What funding do we have and resources do we have available? We need to begin to think about where we're going to find our prospective students. Some of those students will probably come maybe from information that we know about our, the current population that we have in our, enrolled in our programs. We need a plan and we need some data to assess what we're doing after we finish. Faculty are key. And so we need to maximize their strengths as well as our student strengths. They help a lot. The bottom bullet is very, very important. Communicate and market your unique selling programs. Why would they want to come to your program? They have choice out there. And as we communicate with our st prospective students, we have to think about that they use smartphones. So everything that we do has to communicate to them through that. Now, the recruiting funnel on the next slide is what I begin talking with my faculty about so that they understand that the prospects is like the biggest net that you can throw out there. Um, it's any potential student that you might be able to think about that you can recruit into your program. If you look at the funnel, you notice that the funnel gets narrow as it goes from prospect all the way down to enrollment and then finally into graduation. And so our pool gets smaller as we go down. So we wanna cast the largest net that we possibly can cap, market to the broadest group that we can market. Sometimes we wanna target certain um, groups for our program. So today I'm gonna to talk about the inquiries and how important it is to recruit, get those inquiries, people that inquire about our program and convert them to applicants and, and look at that yield. Now, what I wanna say is this, we don't stop recruiting until they are present and enrolled in our programs. So everything in this funnel is about recruiting. In the next slide is where I begin with my faculty and I get them to begin to look at the trends in their data. Now, 
They said, I don't have data. I said, great, start today and start collecting. We want to look at your inquiries. How many people are inquiring about your program? Where are they coming from? And then what we want to do is convert those inquiries to applications. We want to answer those questions and respond to them quickly and also get them to apply to our programs. So in each case, as you move from inquiries to applicants to uh, admissions, students that are admitted to enrolls, you can calculate your yield at each point and that helps you understand the type of pool that you're going to need. While I was Dean, on the next slide, you'll see some of the graduate school recruitment assistance that I was able to provide. Now we were doing this virtually, not virtually, but face to face. So we would prepare travel packs for faculty as they went to conferences that they could, as they met prospective students, they could hand out or even a faculty member where they know that they might have contact with students that could then refer them to our programs. Today we're doing that virtually and I'll talk about something uh, a little bit later that you can do to find more information about how you can recruit virtually. But one thing would be if they're going to a conference, you can have some slides, some digital material where they can provide links to uh, prospective students. We also provided a travel recruitment fund where faculty identified students that they wanted to bring to campus. This next bullet is so important, customizing your communication to that target audience, to that inquiry, to the prospective students and the timing. Get to them fast, get to them first, get to them often. That will help you with your yield and then use different social media platforms. Now you go, I'm not very good at social media and platforms. Your current graduate students can help you. And then one of the things we did a lot was work with our programs to update their websites. And I'm gonna show you an example of that in a few slides as we go. But in the next slide, um, one of the key things that I did was really focus listening to my faculty. We wanted to focus on underrepresented students at the University of Georgia, basically African-American students. Nobody has enough money to recruit all the students that they want. So we learned to leverage the money that we had working in partnership with faculty and programs. And so we leveraged our money so that faculty to travel to HBCUs, um, historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions, send the faculty out there to start to build relationships with the faculty. Because we know that students turn to their faculty advisors to ask, where should I go to graduate school? And we wanted them to think about our programs and our institution. We also used our current students, our underrepresented minority students, and sent them back to their undergraduate institutions. And they were always willing to go back and talk about the great experiences they were having. Doing these things, we were able to develop relationships with institutions and then develop specific feeder school agreements where we could identify working with the other institutions, uh, appropriate students to come into um, the um, University of Georgia. This last bullet involving um, GAPS, Graduate and Professional Student Organizations, that's key. These were our African American students in their professional organization, and they were extremely helpful in terms of recruiting. Additional recruiting strategies that you'll see on the next slide, I want you to think about um, all the services and opportunities that you can think uh, use through um, ETS, whether it's a search service. Um, uh, I always informed uh, on our website, uh, applicants about the fee reduction program for the GRE, about the test prep. Now, earlier I mentioned, you want to think about how to recruit virtually, go to this site, holisticadmissions.org slash navigating through change, and you will see incredible short videos from some of my, my and your college, our peers, talking about recruiting during the COVID and great ideas. One that I really loved was how I can use Zoom and invite a prospective student that's interested in my program to sit in on a particular graduate level class. In the next slide really highlights it all. We need to think and have faculty think like a prospective graduate student. Now, for me, it wasn't yesterday that I was a graduate student. So I need some assistance to thinking about a graduate student. I need to be able to put myself in their shoes. So I use my current graduate students to help me think about what it's like to be a graduate student. So I use them to help 
with recruiting, talk to potential recruits because students want to know really what it's like. And I use them a lot to help evaluate websites. You need to see the website from their perspective, their eyes, not from my eyes, but from theirs. So one of the things we did was really work on websites. And in the next slide, I just highlight some of the key things that we were focused on. We looked at all the websites in our in our different programs. I had a lot of help in doing this. I had graduate students and I had some staff and we were trying to figure out well, what information is available. How easy is it to find it? Is there information that's easily accessible about how to apply? And we found um, as we were doing recruiting workshops, a couple really good examples. And we took these examples on the road and I would go out by college by college or department, I'd go where anybody would listen. And I would bring some good examples and then I would analyze their website and show them where they could improve. And on the next slide, we see an example of how one program provided very valuable information. Remember those unique selling points I mentioned a couple slides back? What makes your program stand out? How are you different than other programs? Integrated Life Sciences is competing with other life science programs in the nation. So you can see in that rectangle um, highlighted red area that there are four uh, bullets. These are key selling points about the program. Very easy to find. You'll notice to the right of that, there's a, um, a section where they highlight a student student um, spotlight. And to the right of that, it's a little shaded, but there's faculty spotlights. So I can actually see what's happening with their current graduate students as well as their faculty. And the two most important things are the circles that are highlighted. Because remember, what I want to do is take my prospect who's inquiring and looking about my program and drive them to apply. So the link at the top and the bottom takes them to the um, inf more information. And when they click on that, you will see in the next slide where they go. It's a one-stop shop piece of information, so valuable. Keep in mind that if I have to keep scrolling and scrolling and clicking and clicking, I'm, I'm done. I'm going someplace else. So having all the valuable information in one place is really helpful. So once they click on how to apply, they go come right here. They have information on deadlines. They know who to contact if they have additional questions about the program, because they're not going to talk to me. As dean, they want to talk to the faculty. We have different codes for different programs. They need that information. It's there. There's also a direct link to the graduate school application. I want to make it easy to convert the person who's interested in the program to convert them to get, getting and filling out an application. And then keeping in mind that I have international students that are looking at, at my website and so uh, in the programs. And so I need a direct link for, um, for these students as well. So all of this is just the beginning part that we did as we went around different campuses, different programs on campus, and, and it was very effective. So on the next slide sort of summarizes quickly what you can do. And I know you already do this. You listen to your faculty. We did that. And what we were hearing on our campus is that they wanted to diversify their, their student population. And so we focused on African-American students. That was sort of a consensus. We set goals. We work with our faculty in how to recruit. Think about what kind of resources. Sometimes it's not money, but it's manpower. Think about how you can use um, graduate students or even undergrads as interns in your office and com from communication or marketing that can help make it easy for your faculty. Use examples from other programs and models as starting points when having conversations with your faculty so they can see. Use the resources available from ETS. And I know they've got another one for um, grad schools match. They're working on that. Also, the communication. There's lots of softwares out there, packages um, from Salesforce to Connect to LinkedIn. Communicate, 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 and tailor it to the student. Use their name. One year, we actually sent out a holiday card to all prospective um, students and that had applied or inquired and wished them well for the holiday season. And we got the, an incredible response back and more applications following. 
make use of your student groups. They can hold webinars. They can help advise you. They can look at um, uh, websites and gives good information. And then finally, acknowledge and reward the faculty, even, even if it's just by praise and holding them up as a model for others to see what they've done. Let them talk to one another because that's how they love to share information. And so my concluding slide is our goal was to increase underrepresented minority graduate students and the end result this did not happen overnight, but working with our faculty on recruiting, we ended up with a 54% increase in African American students, and we managed to do it without a magic wand. Thank you. Steve, I think you're next. Hey, good afternoon. I'm Steve Madsen, currently at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. I want to share with you some practical experiences in using holistic admissions from my time uh, as graduate dean. And specifically, I want to discuss what we learned from two programs that have experimented with the admissions process, the nursing program and the biological and biomedical sciences umbrella admissions program. So let me begin by setting the standard we would all like to achieve, program completion for all of the students that we admit. We all are aware of efforts to increase the recruitment and admission of underrepresented students, only to see some of those students leave the program after a year or two. And that really does not represent success. At UNC, we tried to focus on both the admissions process as well as implementing retention initiatives. I'm going to discuss the nursing program and their experience after waiving the GRE requirement for admission. I'm also going to share information regarding our BBSP program, the Biological and Biomedical Sciences program, which moved over the course of several years to a more holistic admissions process. And in this case, they did not, they did this all without a waiver of the GRE requirement. Then finally, I wanna very briefly share some information on retention initiatives for our biomedical students. And I also will just briefly mention here our diversity and student success program, which covers a much broader set of graduate programs in the university. So let me begin with nursing. The School of Nursing admits students to three degrees, the DNP, the PhD and the MSN. In 2014, nursing requested a waiver of the GRE requirement, stating their belief that it was a barrier for students. In particular, they wanted to increase the diversity of their student population, which was around 20% at that time. In addition, they wanted to ensure that the students they admitted were as qualified as when the GRE was being used as part of the application. And they were gonna measure this by comparing undergraduate GPAs and for the MSN students, the rate of passage of the licensure exam. Well, they immediately saw about a threefold increase in applications to the MSN program. However, there was not a significant increase in the fraction of applicants submitted applications being submitted by underrepresented students. In addition, they weren't really prepared for that increase in applications, and they had some difficulty working through all the applicants in that first year. There was not as noticeable an increase in applications to either the DNP or the PhD programs. They did see a slightly higher GPA, undergraduate GPA, for the matriculated students in all three programs than they had in the past when the GRE was being used. They interpret that to mean that there is no decrease in the quality of the students in the program. But it may also suggest that they're using the undergraduate GPA to screen their applicants. And we all know that G undergraduate GPAs have biases. Ultimately, there was no significant increase in the diversity of the applicant pool or the class of students that were admitted and matriculated. So from that perspective, they did not achieve one of their major goals. And importantly, the increase in applications was a transient phenomenon. There was an initial spike 
and then application numbers have been on a downward trend ever since toward the number of applications uh, that they received prior to the GRE waiver. And I have heard of other programs across the country that have experienced exactly the same phenomenon. Now I wanna to turn to the BBSP program, which has taken a very different route to increasing the diversity of their student population. This is an umbrella admission program. Students remain in the BBSP program for their first year, and then they transition into one of 14 different PhD programs. The program began by looking at the data they had accumulated over a five-year period using a fairly standard admission process. The program receives a large number of applications each year, and the PhD programs they represent graduate over 100 students each year combined. So they had a pretty large data set to examine. Well, they started with the premise that no single component of the application will predict success. And I think we all probably agree with that. The admissions process is imperfect and it is open to bias at many levels. There's potential bias in our use of GRE scores. There's bias in our, your potential bias in our use of undergraduate GPAs. In our view of where the student went to school, and even in our reading of letters of recommendation. So how can the process be improved? Another important aspect of the BBSP program consideration was that we need to spend as much time discussing and thinking about how to support our students as we do in discussing which students to admit. Quite frankly, a large fraction of the students who apply have what it takes to succeed if they have the right support system in place. So the BBSP program began with a research study. Since publishing is the coin of the realm in biomedical sciences, they looked at student productivity in terms of papers published in four categories. Students who had published three or more first author papers, students who had published one or two first author papers, students who had published no first author papers, but had published middle author papers, and students who had published no papers at all. Their analysis of the students who were admitted indicated that the undergraduate GPA did not correlate with productivity, nor did the, gen the GRE general test score, and that's the data that's shown here. In addition, the duration of previous research experience did not correlate with productivity. Recommendation ratings were the most reliable indicator, but even these did not readily suggest who would be productive and who would not be productive by this measure. Now, it's important to recognize that this is only one measure of success. There are many ways to think about success in a graduate program. This was the one metric that the faculty in biomedical sciences thought was incredibly important. But of course, they're looking at this through the lens of someone who wants to have their grant renewed, and that requires published papers. The program decided to move to a more holistic approach to making admissions decisions. The approach involved educating all faculty members about the non-predictive measures of productivity. That is to say, a lower GRE score does not equate with lower productivity. In fact, just as often, the opposite is true. Likewise, a lower undergraduate GPA does not equate with lower productivity, just as a high undergraduate GPA does not predict high productivity. It's important that these factors be used appropriately in making admission decisions. No cut off GRE scores, no cut off undergraduate GPA look deeply and thoroughly at the entire application. In addition, all members of the admissions committee receive implicit bias training each year, just knowing there is implicit bias in decisions that we make can help. And finally, for admitted students that interview, the dossier provided to the faculty interviewers does not contain a transcript or GRE scores, 
And this removes the bias that these create in an interview situation. By providing the student's personal statement and letters of recommendation, the interview can focus on addressing non-cognitive skills, their motivation for coming to graduate school and their interest in specific research areas. Now let's look at the impacts. The new approach was adopted in 2014. The admission of underrepresented students immediately rose from 15 to about 26%. It has since increased to well over 30% in later cycles. And importantly, the retention and completion of the underrepresented students is identical with that of majority students at somewhere between 85 and 95 percent. Here's a set of recommendations for file review resulting from the work done by the BBSP program. Importantly, do not assign predictive powers to items in the application that cannot and do not predict outcomes. You need to define your criteria for admission in advance and consider ways to assess non-cognitive qualifications. The notion of I'll know it when I see it tends to produce new cohorts of students that look an awful lot like us. Equally important are efforts to improve retention and not just of the underrepresented students, but of all the students. This requires that you spend as much time and energy thinking about supporting your students as you do in thinking about who you're going to admit. Our BBSP program does have the advantage of being able to garner significant grant support, and that provides a financial underpinning um, to their support efforts, which at this time includes an office with seven staff that are focused on admissions, professional development, internships, and career advising. But there's no denying that the impact has been extraordinary. The underrepresented students graduate at the same rate as the majority students. And I have to say, I'm incredibly proud of what this program has managed to accomplish using an holistic admissions approach. Thank you. And Carlos, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Steve. Um, this is Carlos Grijalva in sunny, sunny Southern California, and I, I'm hoping that you're all comfortable where you are. Uh, we're going to talk, we're kind of follow up with what Maureen and, and Steve have been talking about. And so we might just begin with the first slide on what our ultimate goals are for graduate admission. Uh, and so if we uh, check some of the things that Steve and Maureen have already mentioned, of course, one of the things that we're looking at is selecting highly qualified, talented applicants who are a good match for our programs in terms of field of study, um, that they have some basic training and skills in that required field. And I think the focus has been on cognitive uh, components, but as uh, both have mentioned, the issue of non-cognitive components are also equally valuable. The things that have to do with motivation, potential, resilience, working with other people, communication skills, honesty and ethics, uh, the things that we kind of fold into the term of emotional intelligence. And there are many studies that have shown that when, with a good balance of those components and basic intellectual abilities, people can be very successful. The goal is also to expand the talent pool in terms of equity, diversion and inclusion. So in the next slide, we look at some of the issues as to why diversity matters. Uh, and I've listed five, there are certainly many more, uh, but one of the key issues that I think we all need to consider is that diversity drives innovation. Uh, there are published studies by Scott Page at the University of Michigan and others that have followed looking at uh, what happens when you bring, bring people together from various backgrounds and experiences. And the fact that they have those experiences really generates a different kind of, of a think tank uh, that really moves things forward. It helps us to become more uh, world citizens. If we are exposed to other people and cultures and traditions, unlike our own, we all grow in a variety of different ways. 
bringing in people from different backgrounds also sheds some light on the life differences that we all have, the struggles, the priorities, the values. Um, this is a very enriching part of what programs at universities are really distinctively known for. This notion of diminishing discrimination, this is a key factor in terms of promoting diversity and it's not a matter of just being more tolerant, but actually truly accepting people. And, and one of the things that I think is really notable is that people may have more in common than we really think we do. And, and this is really key in terms of the acceptance of diversity. It makes our life much richer. Uh, diversity uh, is colorful. It brings in differences. It makes it a beautiful world. Think about foods and, and uh, music and various other things that we all uh, get enriched by. So how do you achieve diversity? We'll take a look at some of these components in the next slide. And I think the key thing here is really you have to go beyond uh, good intentions. You have to show diversity on your websites and make it a front page banner uh, in terms of the, the different uh, keys that you have on your website and your recruiting materials. Uh, if you don't have a mission statement that includes diversity in your department, certainly most universities do have them, then you want to have one. You want to put it to practice. You want to have certain goals for your department uh, and your institutions. You want to show diversity, take a stand in terms of compositions of committees, in terms of uh, opportunities that various students have. And one of the things that Maureen mentioned was this notion of longitudinal data. You don't really know where you stand until you looked at where you've been before. And I know that when I was uh, doing some of the work on diversity with uh, the life sciences departments, sometimes departments thought they were doing just fine because they had a black student or a Hispanic student. And then you take a look at the data and you notice that they haven't shown any change over the last five years. And so having that longitudinal data is very valuable and, and compare it to other departments that are more successful than you might be. So one of the things in the next slide is kind of to remind us that graduate school is really quite different from undergraduate studies. When you're an undergraduate, you're there, you're obtaining knowledge, you're really kind of honing up your new skills. In graduate uh, school, the goal is really not only to obtain knowledge, but contribute to the field of knowledge, to be creative. Um, it's the professional training ground where you learn the skills to be more successful in your field. And this is something that oftentimes uh, certainly underrepresented students have a, a difficulty in communicating to their parents that they, you've already got a bachelor's degree, why do you want to continue to go to school? Um, and uh, so part of it is really making the focus that this is where they bring in all these cognitive and non-cognitive uh, components and talents into play. So what are some of the strategies? And we'll take a look at those in the next few slides in terms of making every one of your students successful. And I'm going to start with three initial principles that we would consider for each student. The first one is that every student is, is a unique individual. The second is that students enter the programs with varying degrees of enthusiasm and concern. And the third is that there are different communities of influence that also affect how successful uh, a student is going to be. So in the next slide, we take a look at some of these unique features. Um, and one of the things is that they are unique in terms of their mental, physical attributes and the personal experiences that have shaped their individuality. They, their differences in intellectual uh, capabilities, uh, educational experiences and opportunities, the schools they've come from, uh, other opportunities they've had while they've been in school, different problem solving skills and strategies. Uh, different acquired uh, skills and talent shaped by various uh, com uh, individuals in their lives, whether it be parents, teachers, coaches, other students. Uh, each uh, student has different social skills, and some of these are partly dependent on dispositional factors, personality factors, if you want to call them that, or situational variables. And sometimes the, the situation will dictate a certain form of behavior um, that that is not necessarily part of their dispositional features, but brings it up because of the situation. And then of course, every student may have different uh, available resources, whether it's finances, social support systems, uh, time to do the things that they need to do because of other obligations and on and on and on. Um, secondly, in the next slide, we take a look at some of the um, uh, aspects that have to do with success 
components, uh, this, this notion of enthusiasm and concern. And certainly I know that when I got accepted or admitted into graduate school, that was a big deal. And I felt like I was floating on air and you're really proud of the fact that you have this new status. And then, but it also uh, is the case with many of the students that the imposter syndrome begins to set in, that they begin to doubt themselves. Well, am I good enough? You know, uh, my degree is from so-and-so university and all these other people are coming from these high-end institutions and I, there's no way that I'm going to compete with them. So they start thinking about these issues that challenge their self-esteem. And then there are other issues that have to do with fit fit in the department, fit in the lab, fit in if it happens to be a non-scientific uh, group, maybe it's a performance group, am I good enough to, to be part of this elite um, group? Uh, making friends, you know, the fact that they're coming uh, from other institutions and uh, they have to set up new whole social structure is part of the challenges. And then the social network come into play. Uh, is it gonna meet my emotional, personal, or civic engagement needs? Time management skills are another very important part of it. In the next slide, we take a look at some of the other concerns that are non-academic in nature. And these are things that, that we often don't really think about um, in a structured way. Uh, the, the concerns that the student might have about family, family members, maybe they're married, maybe they have spouses, maybe they have children, maybe they have obligations to other critters, pets, and so on and so forth. Health concerns, their own, con their own health, health of their friends, health of the loved ones. Financial concerns, short-term and long-term. This comes into the financial packages that Marina talked about. Um, housing concerns, uh, transportation concerns. In Los Angeles, we're, we have the challenge that uh, apartments are very expensive in our area because we're kind of centered in the Beverly Hills area. So they've got to think about living away from campus and how they're going to get uh, forward and back, but probably the two most important ones are the two last bullet points, and that is the feelings of belongingness, belongingless or alienation and isolation. And this is really key in terms of the kind of environment that we set for them. And then the second is the issue of bias and prejudice. And again, this comes in to play very strongly with underrepresented minorities, whether or not they feel that they're in an environment that is really accepting of them. And in other cases, whether they're little subtleties, microaggressions that they kind of pick up on that makes the environment less, less hospitable. Um, in the next slide, we look at some of these communities of influence. Um, I kind of labeled them as uh, two different ones, academic, professional, and non-academic. So in the next slide, we look at the academic <clears throat> components of these communities of influence. And we're going to put the student at the center stage here. And of course, the immediate uh, sphere is that of the advisor uh, or the mentor, uh, the relationship that they have to build in terms of how they succeed. Uh, and then there are dynamics of other people that are also part of that advisor's group, the lab, uh, the research group, uh, you know, are they supportive? Are they competitive? Uh, some, I've had situations where it, in some environments are wonderful, some are a hostile environment to the student for a variety of different reasons. So one has to deal with that. The department and institution, of course, are resources that provide opportunities for money, uh, for uh, honor society, uh, involvement for graduate student association groups as was mentioned before and then the outer sphere of course is the notion of professionalization how they're interacting with the advisor of the department to reach out to attend conferences and meetings um, so the whole professionalization component is really quite key in the next slide we take a look at the non-academic uh, communities of influence and we'll kind of have the student is at the center stage with all their unique features and backgrounds and the institutions they've come to, and maybe their own personal concerns that may be expressed or not expressed uh, to their mentor, their faculty, things that may have to do with health, things that may have to do with relationships they have both in and outside of the university. Uh, again, going back to this notion of alienation or acceptance and how that ties into it. Uh, they all have families, I would hope, and hopefully those families are harmonious, but some are not. Some are kind of riddled with conflict, and, you know, that's a background of stress that comes into play for the student. And then, of course, there, we don't live in a vacuum. We live in a, 
an environment that um, has uh, both positive and negative components of it. The students may be worried about the politics of the day. They may be worried about the economy. They may wor be worried about the uh, environment. They may be worried about civil unrest, public health with COVID. So we all, they all have a lot of baggage to carry and we've got to kind of figure out a way so that they, we kind of help them navigate through some of these struggles and stresses that, that, uh, that are um, key to them. Uh, I teach courses on stress and one of the things that we know that really adds to stressful uh, experiences is the lack of predictability and the lack of control. And so if the student can't predict what the outcomes might be, that's gonna be stressful and they're not gonna shine as well as they can if they also feel that they have a lack of control, even perceived lack of control, that can be very stressful too. So we wanna to help to make those adjustments to make their, uh, their situation more predictable and more controllable. So in the next slide, um, we also consider this uh, issue of the life cycle in the program and the benchmarks. And I don't have to tell you that uh, each one of these stages has, has different demands and different expectations. Probably uh, at the very beginning, this notion of integrating them into the program is key. Towards the later end, it's this notion of the thesis or dissertation writing. And as we all know, that can be a very lonely experience. And so you've got to set up a, a, a situation where you help them out, you give them a lot of feedback. And I think the key thing here is, is feedback uh, on progress in the program and whether or not they're meeting the important benchmarks in timely fashion. These are really very important things. We've got to keep in touch with them. We can't just send them off and say, okay, go write your dissertation. I'll see you in six months. Or in some cases, I'll see you whenever I see you. <laughs> so we've got to really, stay on task with uh, where they are and where they're going. Uh, in the next slide, we look at other types of additional support and uh, we, uh, we uh, dwell on a variety of things, but again, we have to make sure that when they're coming in, we give those components that are really key to their survival, the financial support, multi-year packages, uh, housing security, if there's some assistance you might be able to give them. The thing is you want to make them feel welcome. And, and believe it or not, we did some studies at UCLA showing that as long as they feel as though they're in a good environment, that actually ends up outweighing the importance of a lot of money. I'm not saying that they don't need the money, but the, the balance is that if they're happy, they can make adjustments. Create a buddy system with advanced graduate students and postdocs. I think that's really quite key. Uh, building a community of scholars, both within the institution and beyond. Uh, in the next slide, we also take a look at some other types of support, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on them. I think these are really quite obvious to all of us, this notion of academic support. If they need some help in certain fields or certain areas, the notion of tutoring comes into play, writing workshops, I don't think we spend enough time looking at writing uh, capabilities. Um, I think the GRE uh, writing uh, assessment components are really wonderful because it gives you a sense of whether I got to need some help down the road or not. Uh, and then there's the medical, mental, physical components, and these include stress management resources that may be uh, directed towards special needs that they may have, either uh, for LGBTQ. Uh, components or underrepresented minority uh, associations. Uh, in the next slide, we also take a look at um, other forms of support, and these have to do with uh, writing again, with uh, helping them to uh, create this notion of independence through um, uh, opportunities to show what they've done, presentations, get them involved in professional societies, uh, the one thing towards the end are what many institutions are going towards, and the, these are these kind of three-minute thesis presentations of the research, uh, uh, coin uh, graduate slams, and these are like little mini TED talks that they uh, give a synopsis of what they're doing and why it's important. This is really good. So where does this all uh, lead us to? And I think it leads us to the, the uh, issues of the next slide, and that is mentoring. Um, and we all know that mentoring is a, a close relationship, an individualized relationship that develops over time between the graduate student and faculty member, but it's really uh, distinct from advising. And so mentors can be advisors, 
advisors can have a mentoring role, but they are different in terms of what they provide. So in the next slide, um, um, I think this statement is really key. Effective mentoring involves not only the transfer of academic skills, attitudes, and behaviors, but a level of interaction, trust, and communication, which empowers the student with the knowledge and confidence to grow academically and socially, regardless of their environment. So what does mentoring involve? Let's take a look at that in the next slide. We can talk about structured mentoring programs and many departments and universities have uh, initial trainings for young faculty. Many of them have awards uh, for mentoring either within the departments or within the universities. Um, but the key thing here is not that you have one, one mentor, but that you have multiple mentors. And so the notion of vertical mentoring um, includes not only the faculty, more than one faculty, but uh, postdocs, advanced graduate students, and so forth. Um, the more mentors, the better. And, and I, I would say that we should think about the structure of, the social structure of crows. So many crows, especially during the, uh, the nesting season, live in family groups. Uh, mated uh, pairs share territories with their grown children, then the older offspring in turn help their parents to raise each of the season's new brood of young birds. So it takes a village, and I think if we take that, that notion, it really helps. Horizontal mentoring uh, involves cohorts and peers. You want to define what the roles are, and you want to ref refine those mutual interests. But I think what really is uh, key here is that there is a genuine interest in the welfare and well-being of the student, that you help to professionalize them, you empower them, uh, the mentors have to be available, committed, compassionate, patient, and, and in turn to be a positive role model, not only as a, as a per person, but also as a professional. And if we kind of stick to these values uh, and these concerns, I think the students all will succeed. So the last slide just supports that idea. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh uh, Carlos, uh, Steve, and Maureen for your insights and sharing your experiences with us today. Again, as a reminder, if you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A window. Um, we did get one question in and it's directed to, to Steve and it says, I'm hoping to bring some of these statistics back to my faculty. Has the holistic approach and related data been published? Yes. There are a couple of publications that you can look at. And I think one that I would recommend is uh, one by Miranda Wilson from uh, MD, Cander MD Anderson Cancer Center in Texas. It was published in 2019. Um, different program, but the same idea and um, learned exactly the same thing as the data I presented um, here. You can also find uh, some of this data in a paper it was published in about 2016, and I cannot remember the name of the lead author on that, but if it comes to me, I will share it with you. But anyway, I would recommend the 2019 paper by Miranda Wilson from MD, Cander, uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center. Okay. Any other questions for to the today's panelist? We have about eight minutes left. Any last minute comments or thoughts from our panelists? One of the things that I um, forgot to mention, and this came up from an idea from our graduate students, and they wanted to show prospective students a day in the life of a graduate student. And so uh, we worked uh, to get GoPro cameras and they put the camera on and they recorded sort of the day in the lab, their time in the library, a little bit about town, a little bit about the community. And we then partnered with the program and hosted it on the graduate school website, as well as um, the website in the program to help prospective students really get a feel for what it was like to be a graduate student in that program. Uh, 
any suggestions for navigating faculty buy-in for some of these approaches? Well, Matt, let me uh, say a few words about that. I know that uh, I've been asked that question many, many times. And the approach that I think has been most successful is to develop um, interactive workshops um, on your campus, preferably using faculty from your campus that have adopted a more holistic approach to their admissions process. We did that while I was Dean here at UNC um, and the name of the individual was Josh Hall, just came to me. We had uh, Josh Hall run those workshops and the fact that they were interactive um, allowed faculty to really examine their own admissions processes and what they were doing and compare them with more holistic admissions processes. And I, I think that has made a change in the way a number of programs have approached holistic admissions. Um, so that would be at least one suggestion. Um, and I know that there are other schools that have mandated uh, adopting holistic admissions uh, from a more top-down approach. Um, I don't know that that uh, generates as much faculty buy-in as a, a, a you know, some sort of workshop where the faculty are really becoming engaged and, and begin to believe in what the process can yield. We just had a question come in. Um, uh, did anyone identify specific holistic recruiting strategy, strategies for indigenous students in particular, or do you have any suggestions? So one of the things we did not, but one of the things I would say is begin to identify um, and build relationships where those students are currently uh, going to undergrad. And it's usually in tribal colleges and try to build relationships with the faculty there um, because it's key from my understanding um, that your community that you're going to bring them into needs to be supportive and understanding of the needs of these students so that you can support the whole student. If, if I might also add, I think it's really key to understand some of the components of their culture, uh, and that includes international students as well, is that they may have certain ways that they deal with people of authority that are, are we kind of view as, as unassertive or too assertive, and I think we need, need to appreciate the fact that they've got things that they have uh, been um, socialized to that are part of what we need to understand. And that's why diversity is really key in terms of working with people outside the box. Yeah, let me add to that. We spent some time, we have an American Indian Center here on campus, which was developed about 20 years ago. Um, and that center together with the graduate school and undergraduate admissions uh, began to establish tribes uh, ties with the tribal leadership, mm -hmm. um, particularly in the western part of North Carolina, but throughout the southeast, um, with an eye toward understanding more about their culture and having them understand more about what their what students would experience as graduate students here, and that improved um, our ability to attract um, undergraduate students who were indigenous. We, once we, um, at, here at NC State, we looked at um, connecting the graduate students from indigenous tribes together so that they would have a support network and, and a community in addition to other communities. And so that was one of the key things. Also, we hired someone in our graduate office that was from an indigenous tribe to help recruit. Okay, well, I think we are at about uh, almost out of time. So I'm going to say merci. Thank you so much for attending today's session. Um, just as a reminder, the slide deck will be made available to all of you on the conference platform and we'll be able, you will be able to access that for the next 12 months. In addition, according of today's session will be posted on the association's YouTube channel. Again, feel free to reach out to any of the panelists and myself. Uh, directly. We would love to hear from you. And again, enjoy the remainder of the conference and of course the weekend. Thank you so much. Merci.
I'd just like to think, think, uh, quickly thank all the presenters for joining us today. The session was very informative and interesting. I mean, we really appreciate you being here. Um, and just a reminder to all the attendees um, that you're welcome to join any networking breaks, exhibit halls, or following sessions we have. So thank you all for joining, and I hope you have an amazing rest of the day and a great weekend.